And then I'm going to invite Justin Hart out here because he can be said to be the parent of Nico, which is another one of this uh, growing collection of social robots that can see and hear and react as though human with sound and with mimicked human movements. For the moment, though, like most of these devices, she lacks a torso and she lacks the limbs that would allow her into your home to pick up bottles, mix you a cocktail, or take care of grandma. To do those things, the robot must become self-aware and work alongside us in unobtrusive ways. Possibly even responding not only to verbal commands, but to physical ones like waving or even a caress. Justin, can you come up here and continue the story? For the PowerPoint? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me see how this thing works. And maybe not put this right next to the camera. All right. So I'm Justin Hart, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Social Robotics Laboratory at Yale University, where I work with Professor Brian Scassolati. And what this picture is, is this is a photo of my humanoid robot, Nico. And what Nico's doing is it's looking at its arm in the mirror, and it sees the reflection. And what it does is it moves its arm around and infers the visual perspective of the mirror. So it sees the three-dimensional image of the hand on the other side of the mirror, but it knows that the hand's over here. And it's very, very accurately uh, reasoned about where that hand is by reasoning about itself. So sort of the big idea behind this talk is that I've built a robot which is able to learn about its body and its senses through the experience of using them in conjunction with each other. And this is one of the most primitive forms of self-awareness that develops in infancy. Modern robots are capable of a lot of amazing things. Most of the world's major automotive manufacturers uh, will try to field some sort of autonomous vehicle in the next few years. So you'll buy a car, and it'll drive itself to where you want to go. The robot in the middle is made by a company called Rethink Robotics, and it's called Baxter, and it's a collaborative manufacturing robot. So the idea is that humans will be able to teach robots and work right alongside them in factories. And the one on the right is the Willow Garage PR2, and that's over at their headquarters in Menlo Park, California. And what that uh, robot just did is it just made a pool shot. Uh, despite all these amazing things that robots do, they really don't tend to think a lot about themselves. They don't learn about themselves. They tend to learn how to perform tasks. And so I'm trying to change that by building a robot which learns about itself. Robots usually go through something like this when they're first constructed. Uh, what's on the left is a picture of me holding up a chessboard calibration target. And what the robot does is it runs a piece of software that was written by me. It looks at this target, and it knows the shape of the target. I move it around. And it learns optical properties of its cameras that allow it to see in 3D. Uh, on the right is a very technical drawing. And I apologize that there will be a lot of very such technical drawings in this talk. But what it describes is the, is the motion of a single joint. And when robots are designed, the designers tend to draw drawings that look something like this to describe how the robot moves. And then the robots are given files which describe their motion in order to help them how to plan how they will move. There are some real problems with this. One of the first problems is that the knowledge of vision and kinematics, how the robot moves, come from two different places. And so they can subtly disagree with each other. Uh, in fact, you expect them to subtly disagree with each other, and normally we kind of work around this. So to the degree that they disagree with each other, the robot's motion planner can say, my hand's going to be over here. And then when the robot sees it in its visual field, it's actually somewhere over here. And so people kind of work around this level of disagreement. But as we start to field more and more complicated robots in people's homes or in public places, and not in factories where we have an expert engineer who's able to tweak this and calibrate the robot, this could become a really serious problem. So if you want to have a humanoid robot in your home, we're not going to require the home user with no degree in engineering to go, oh, well, the robot damaged one of its joints. Let me put in some new numbers to represent the new joint angles and the new field of motion. Let me uh, hold up the calibration chessboard because it bashed its eye. And now it'll start to move right again. We can't count on home users to do that. 
And if we have somewhere that's just inaccessible, like outer space, and we have a really comp physically complicated robot up there, even though there's a terrestrial ground crew working on that robot, now that ground crew has to solve the calibration issue in space, where they can't even get to the robot to fix it. Humans, on the other hand, have no such limitations. Humans learn about their body and their senses through the experience of using them in conjunction with each other. Infants move their arms around in their visual field, and they learn how they move, and they learn how their vision works just by using it. And so what I wanted to do is build a robot that's able to do that. Now, the big test of self-awareness in humans and animals is something called the mirror test. It was developed by Gordon Gallup in 1970, and it works something like this. You introduce a mirror into an animal's enclosure, and when the animal first encounters the mirror, they don't know how the mirror works, they don't know what it does, they start to socially engage the mirror. They try to play with it, they bark at it, they yell at it, they do all sorts of things. And so, once that behavior sort of abates, what they do is they anesthetize the animal under a general anesthetic, they put it, a little bit of dye on its forehead that's non-tactile so they can't feel it, and odorless so they can't smell it, and if, when the animal next encounters a mirror, they do a self-directed gesture like touching it, rather than an other-directed gesture, like touching it in the mirror, the animal is considered to be self-aware. Now, humans are able to do this around 18 and 24 months, and this test has been of interest to the robotics community for a really long time because of interest in developing self-aware artificial intelligence and self-aware robots. But to date, no robot has ever passed anything like a full mirror test, and that includes my robot. But we wanted to frame this problem, the problem of self-awareness, in a way that we could study it. And so what we did is we came up with the concept of robot self-modeling. And the idea of robot self-modeling is constructing robots which learn about their hardware and their sensors through data sample during operation. So a digital version of the primitive sets of self-awareness that infants first develop. And we developed a six-phase plan. In the first phase, all we're interested in doing is learning how the robot's arm moves. We're not interested in doing any sensing. We're going to use an external motion tracker, which is of the sort that they use in Hollywood special effects when they want to you know, render some cool robotic arm on top of an actor's arm. In the second phase, what we're going to do is we're going to integrate in the robot's vision system. The robot has a stereo vision system that lets it see in 3D. There's a left eye camera and a right cam eye camera embedded in its eyes. If it knows where two points match up in the images in the left and right cameras, it can see where that is in 3D. And we're going to kind of cheat on matching up those points. We're going to use a marker on the robot's hand. We'll see that in the next few slides. And in phase three, which is where people really sort of started noticing this work, we're going to perform this sort of perspective taking. And the idea is that we're going to look at the robot's self-directed motion in the mirror in order to interpret where the mirror is and infer the spatial transformation that the mirror imposes on space. Now, that's just a complicated way of saying, I see something on the other side of the mirror, but I know where it is on this side of the mirror. The remaining three phases have to, have to do with learning the 3D structure of the robot and the coloration of the robot, so we can generate a picture of what we think the robot looks like in the mirror, and the robot can compare it, and then eventually pass this mirror test. And that's what we're working on now. So, in the first phase, we're just concerned with the arm. Uh, the graphic isn't super clear, so let me explain what's going on here. Uh, the arm's made up of two, of two mechanical linkages, sort of like this. They're actuated by four joints that go like this, and it allows the robot to move its arm around and reach at objects in space. And what we want to do is we want to learn how the arm moves by witnessing it move. So the learning algorithm is inspired by two basic insights. The first is that all these are rotating joints, they're revolute joints. And so what that means is, is that as the arm moves through space, it traces a circle. If I measure that circle, I can calibrate the joint that corresponds to it. I can say, boom, that's the joint that generated that circle. So if I do that for all the robot's joints, it's able to come up with an initial estimate of how its arm moves. It's not a great estimate because of limitations in where the robot can see when it's doing it with its vision system, but it's an initial estimate. And then I can refine that system by doing what's called motor babbling and using a mathematical technique called optimization. And what you can think of this as is the robot kind of closes its eyes and goes, OK, I'm going to plant a motion, and I put my arm over here. It opens its eyes, and it really sees it over here. And so what it does is every time it messes up one of those motions, every time the arm isn't where it expects it to be, it sees that those things were subtly different and improves its knowledge of itself based on those differences. And this is actually something that gives us a very strikingly accurate model of the robot's arm. So the robot's arm is 260 millimeters long, 
and this will build a model which is accurate to within 7.5 millimeters simply by watching their arm move around. And that's really, really accurate. That's competing with algorithms which are accurate to within centimeters. The second thing, phase two, merging kinematics and vision, we have our stereo vision system. We have a left and a right eye camera. If we see a point in the left camera and the right camera, we're able to see where that is in 3D. If we have a point in 3D, something like a guess as to where the robot's hand will be, we can project that point onto the left and right cameras. So we can project our guess into that image. We can see both where we actually see something and where we predicted to see something in both 2D and in 3D. And this is a merging in the visual sense. This is something that's present in humans, but not really present in robots. Usually the kinematic systems that describe the motion and the sensory systems which describe the senses aren't tightly calibrated enough to each other to do this kind of reasoning. We managed to do that, and the basic step is that we do the same kinematic learning routine that we did before, but we do it with the robot's visual field. But there's a problem with this. Oh, that doesn't look the way I expected it to, so let me tell you what it should look like. Um, there is always error uh, when you reconstruct something in stereo. There's always error in any sensor. To the degree that there is error in the stereo vision system's reconstructions of things, things that look like cubes can look kind of like trapezoids. So if I have a physical cube in the real world, when I image it with the 3D vision system, it might look like a trapezoid. And this has to do with problems in the robot's estimates of its focal length of its cameras, the position of the cameras, and the orientation of the cameras. So the degree that the robot doesn't know these things, or the degree that these things are miscalibrated, the world space in front of the robot is going to be distorted. Its perception of space will be distorted. So what we do is we built an algorithm which is inspired by the way that infants do this. We, I just discussed how the robot's able to kind of thrash its arm around and learn how the arm moves. But if I do it in 2D instead of in 3D, if I do it on the image of how the arm moves, I'm actually able to refine my visual sense right alongside the sense of how the robot moves. And this is inspired exactly by how infants do it. This is something that I consider one of the important, interesting takeaways of this talk. Uh, so let me go back over it. The robot now learns about how it moves and how it sees simply by watching itself move in its visual field. So it learns about its body and senses through the experience of using them with respect to each other. And this is remarkably useful. This is something that we can do to build self-calibrating machines, highly accurate machines which always retain their calibration without human intervention, highly accurate machines which you could deploy in your home, machines which identify when they're failing, when they fault, when they break, and they can also do things like gracefully degrade. They can do interesting things like pick up tools, and this will help us move along the way to robotic tool use. And this also improves our classical techniques. This robot is now accurate to within Oh boy, I can't remember, but it's like four millimeters accuracy in terms of the uh, location of the hand, a couple pixels in the visual field. The kinematic model is accurate to within 1% the length of the mechanical linkage. So this is a remarkably accurate calibration. So now we should talk about mirror use. And in this example, the robot uses its model of itself in order to reason about something in its environment. And so I want to introduce another mirror task that fewer people are familiar with, and that's the use of a mirror for spatial reasoning. So this picture comes from one of my favorite mirror interaction papers in animals. And in it, what's going on here is this monkey is sitting on a shelf. So it's in a cage. There's a mirror tied to the side of the cage. The monkey sits on a shelf, and under the shelf are some food pellets. And there's a gap between the shelf and the edge of the cage, which is wide enough for the monkey's arm, but not enough for its head. So the monkey has to use the mirror in order to reach the food pellets. It's going to use the mirror as an instrument for spatial reasoning. And this is an ability that occurs in infants prior to the ability to be able to identify themselves in the mirror. And it occurs in some animals that are unable to pass the mark test at all. Some people consider this to be a precursor to mirror self-recognition. Translating this to our robot, we're going to determine the visual perspective describing reflections in the mirror. And what that means is, is the robot sees in 3D by using its cameras, and what we're going to do is we're going to make a virtual camera, a fake camera that exists on the opposite side of the mirror that represents what the robot sees in the mirror. And the way we're going to do this is the robot knows where its hand is in 3D based on what it's learned about itself. It's able to see where its hand is in the mirror. So the blue dot represents where it, it sees its hand. The green dot represents where its hand actually is. So it knows that they're on opposite sides of the mirror. It's it knows that this is a reflection. And it's able to identify the plane that the mirror exists in. 
And then from that, we're able to compute the perspective that represents the mirror. And then the robot's able to do the exact same thing it did in the past two phases. In phase one, it kind of thrashed its arm around, it learned how its arm moved. In phase two, it thrashed its arm around, it learned the visual relationship between its arm and its visual system. And in phase three, we're adding a mirror into that sort of model of how it sees the world. And this allows the robot to really accurately look into the mirror and say, hey, here's where I see a reflection, but here's where the object actually is based on that. And what's really exciting about this, it is exciting the robot uses the mirror, but what's really exciting about this is the robot has developed a primitive form of self-awareness and is able to use that to reason about real objects in the real world. So going back to our three-phase model, what I've just explained is the first three phases of that. The remaining phases have to learn with learning about the 3D structure of the robot, its geometry, and what we can basically do in order to project an image into that perspective that we just generated in the mirror. And from there, we plan to build what's called a classifier that says, this is what I expected to see, but this is what I see, so I can identify those differences and pass a full mirror test. So where do we go from here, and what are we trying to do with all this? Well, Techniques related to this could be used to develop highly robust machinery, machinery that self-calibrates, machinery that stays accurate without human intervention. So if you had a manufacturing scenario, you were interested in really accurately building parts, those robots wouldn't necessarily drift over time. They would detect that they were drifting. Automatic fault detection, diagnosis, and recovery, so it could gracefully degrade operation. You could picture one of those self-driving uh, self vehicles popping a tire and it knows that it bursts the tire and helps the driver get to safety before shutting down entirely and asking for help from a mechanic, all automatically. We can also do some flexible learning of the self alongside skills. We haven't done this yet, but the idea is this. Most robots learn how to perform a task if they learn how to do something of that nature, but they don't learn about themselves. What if we had a piece of software that you could install on an arbitrary robot and say, do this task, and it learns the task and it learns the structure of the robot together? So you could develop one truly flexible piece of software that you could deploy on a variety of robots. Uh, people are becoming interested in tactile sensing, and to think about it like this, if you reach around in the dark or you reach around in your drawer for scissors, you know where the scissors are because you're matching how you move up with the map of the tactile sensors along your skin. And I would argue that a model such as I developed is a really good starting point for that research. Uh, there are also very interesting social notions of self-awareness, comparing what I know about myself to what you know about you, what you know about me, to, and back and forth, and that's called theory of mind. So I can reason about you as an agent by reflecting on myself. We can do some interesting visual things. I can take your visual perspective and say, I see this, you see this. Can we build that into a robot? I see that you see me on stage. I know that. Uh, joint attention has to do with pointing at things, me directing your attention to something with a pointing gesture. I've been doing it all talk. Learning by demonstration is the idea that I can demonstrate how to perform a skill, and you can map it. Well, what if the robot could do that by mapping its knowledge of itself onto you, and then mapping your action onto itself, and doing some comparison? Uh, there's actually been quite a lot of research in the robotics literature related to that. I'm suggesting enhancing it with this software. There's also the concept of ad hoc teaming and collaboration. We compare what we're doing to each other, try to recognize each other's plans, and act off each other. So two robots want you to pick up a box. I know that I'm on one side. You know you're on one side. We can coordinate our actions. We can play a game. Robot soccer is very popular. I've flipped the idea by some of those people of having a robot that looks at the strategy of the other team and learns that strategy or learns how fast they're able to move and is like, oh, I can trip the other robot. Oh, uh, I can intercept its pass. So these are a few of the ideas that we're kind of pursuing with all this. And finally, I'd just like to thank my lab mates at the Social Robotics Lab at Yale University, my doctoral advisor, Brian Scassolati, uh, another mentor of mine, Steven Zucker, and uh, Dan Laysberg and Larissa Hall for their help with some of the illustrations appearing in this talk. Uh, so thank you. I'm, I'm curious to know how many of you talk to your Siri on your iPhone, continuously, right? Not just as a gadget you tried once and then you stopped using. How many of you? Not bad. And how many of you yell at your GPS? <laughs> <laughs> a much larger number. <laughs> <laughs>